Hello, <laughs> baby. After some period of time of digging around in very deep waters, we come to a refreshment in chapter 8 of the book of Romans. And how grateful for me to be there. From chapter 5, when the Bible said that we were of Adam's seed, and having therefore from Adam his image, and that the sinful condition that has been our toil and trouble from the first breath until this very day, and will be our toil and trouble until the last breath of this life from Romans 5 and that indictment that we're under in Adam we also heard in Romans 5 that wonderful hope of the second Adam Jesus Christ and we learned that we could be forever under the law of Adam the curse of Adam the judgment of Adam or we could reside in unity with the second Adam our Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 6, we learned further about unity with this one that helps us to have eternal life and not be cursed eternally because of our sin. Chapter 7, the Apostle Paul said over and over how difficult it is, even though we are in union with Christ, to live as we should. And he says, the sin that I hate, I still do. And this is our plight, isn't it? That we live in this troubled time where we desire to do good, but the ability to fully and consistently and perfectly do that good that we desire, we do not find within us. So we've had five, six, and seven, a deep crevice of despair, which when we see it, we only find little glimpses along the way for our encouragement. But thankfully for that encouragement, we do get from the Holy Spirit, like Paul when he said in chapter 7, verse 24, and he said, oh, woe is me, what a wretched man that I am. Who shall loose me? Who shall free me from the bondage of this death? And then chapter 5 of 7, the apostle Paul said, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now that's very important. At the very end of chapter 7 where he said, Woe is me, wretched man that I am. Who shall free me from this problem of the sinful tendency that I still have? Thanks be to God, it's Jesus. And then chapter 7 ends. But then chapter 8 begins. And there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I said that we've been in a deep abyss, a crevice, a dark place of despair in chapters 5, 6, and 7 with only remedial and momentary glimpses of hope. But now we come to the full orb light of the glorious gospel said by many commentaries. Chapter 8 is at the very pinnacle of greatness of revelation of the gospel. And I agree. There is therefore now no condemnation. And what is my problem? Sin. And what is the remedy? Christ glorious over death, hell in the grave. And this for us, this great, great, glorious, beautiful gospel. With all this in mind, I feel like I'm touching a radioactive material. How would you begin I felt struggling through all of this time of trying to deal with the hard stuff. Now we come to the refreshment. How do I, how do I touch this thing so precious and beautiful? I remember the day that I was married and having dated Dina for a year and I knew Dina, I mean like I, I've seen her a thousand times and I remember standing right there, not at this church, but in one like it, standing right there, and my pastor standing right here, not in this church, but in one like it. And I heard the wedding march. That was when, back in the day, they did a wedding march. You know. uh, no, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying. 
And so the wet, and I looked, and there she was. And I told myself, you capture this moment in your memory bank because you can call upon it forever when you wonder if she loves you or if she's angry at you or what do I do to feel better about life. I can just pull back my memories. This is the beauty of studying the Bible. There's no condemnation because Jesus was condemned for us. And therefore, whenever you're feeling discouraged or worried or am I okay with God or am I living in chapter 6 and 7? Am I still caught up too deeply in the rut of the problem of my sinful nature? You can just pull up the memory that you placed in your memory bank. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the glow upon Dean's face, I can see it right now. This is how the Bible is to me. Now some of you are missing your Bible. Some of you are missing your Bible because you don't look at it. Or if you do, you think it mysterious and impossible. It's not mysterious or impossible. It's interpreted by the Holy Spirit. So you open it, and you say, Holy Spirit, what's in here? And the Holy Spirit is like a, a spectacle of lens of correction and clarity. And uh, back then, I didn't need them to see Dina's face and beauty. Well, now I need them to see anything. The Holy Spirit is like the spectacles of clarity and reality when you open your Bible. And you, what you need, oh my goodness, what you need is for the Holy Spirit to confirm with you that you are a child of God to such a degree, that confirmation, that it causes you to yearn for another land, another world, another place, an eternal land, and this house wasting away, this earthly body wasting away. And what you need is the Holy Spirit to confirm with your spirit that you are a child of God some of you don't have that confirmation because your whole existence thus far in your life has been to keep the rules of the church or to be an obedient denominational worker or you give your offering or you come and do your time or you do your serving works. Some of you do not have the confirmation of the Holy Spirit that you are a child of God and know oh, how desperately you need it. So in this dark hours of chapters 5, 6, and 7, now we're, we're cresting to the top of the hill. We saw the sun lit behind it. We knew there was going to be a sun rising, but we haven't seen the full orb of it. Well, now we're cresting the top of the hill, and here's the glory. Romans chapter 8, I've been begging you to bring a Bible. I don't know what to do. Am I going to have to come to your house? You don't have to bring your Bible. I'm going to keep putting the main scriptures up here. But if you brought your Bible, Romans chapter 8. You can use your phone, too. It's got a Bible on it. I had... Uh, I put out online this week in promotion of this uh, message. It won't, it won't move. Will you run it? Uh, thank you. There you are. Thanks. Um, I put this out this week, and I want you to meditate on this before we read our scripture. We're only going to do four verses, and unless I get crazy, we're going to have very brief time together, which I, I very well could go crazy, you know. Uh, God doesn't love you more if you do better, and God doesn't love you less if you do worse. His love is perfect for you at this very moment. Uh, let's say it another way. Uh, God could not love me more than he does right now. God could not love me more than he does right now. I want to invite you to say that aloud with me. God could not love me more than he does right now. Are we ready? God could not love me more 
than he does right now. And why could God not love me more? Because to love at all is perfection, because God doesn't work in portions. His love is perfect, complete. The very definition of love, he has it and he extends it, and you're the recipient of it. And oh, how comforting in this uh, time where we know our weaknesses, we know our trouble, we know our needs, we know our uh, temptations, but God couldn't love me more. Do you mean in the middle of me acting, feeling, thinking like the Apostle Paul, where he said, the good I want to do, I can't seem to do it, but the bad I don't want to do, I seem to keep on doing it, and I'm like him, like Paul, and God couldn't love me more? This is because God has chosen to extend forgiveness. The name of the sermon is forgiven, not condemned. We live in the world of condemnation. We condemn ourselves. Society condemns us. Our peers condemn us. And in fact, without God, without Jesus forgiving us, the law condemns us because we're guilty of breaking it. And so um, God doesn't love you more if you do better. Like you can't get some more love because if he loves you at all, then it's perfect in the expression that he gives to you. And God couldn't love you less if you do worse. His love is perfect for you at this very moment. There's therefore now no condemnation. Let's read the entirety of chapter 8 verses 1 through 4. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, our flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he, God, condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in whom? In us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I'll divide these uh, four verses with seven questions. And the seven questions are a gospel in summary. For whom? I'll explain that in verse 1. And what is this gospel in summary? No condemnation. And when is this available? Now. And in whom is this available? In Christ. And how is it available? God has done it. To what end is this great and glorious, beautiful gospel? To what end is it? It is that the requirement of the law be fulfilled in us. And evidenced by what? That we walk by the Spirit, not by the flesh. So let's take these seven questions and apply it to our little four verses. What? First question number one, what? There is therefore. Let's stop right there. Now you can see it. There's therefore now no condemnation. That's the good, that's the good stuff. There is, uh, there is therefore. Now the therefore means that we've got to go back for. Now, I don't mean four chapters or four books. I just mean we got to go back for that way. Back for. Y'all don't use that term, do you? Backwards. Do you use that term? Backwards? The other direction. Therefore, what is this? Uh, For whom is this? It is this no condemnation gospel, this beauty of free gifted gospel, this this greatness that God forgives, not the basis on our our works. (laughs) For whom is it for? For those that were in the situation back there. Back there where? Back there from all of the book of Romans. Back there for those people like in chapter 1, who because of their rebellion and stubbornness, God had turned them over to their fleshly nature and they, uh, they just kind of kept on going that direction because that's what they had a desire to do. 
And it's like those uh, persons who were legalists in the, in, that we learned about, and it's about those people who uh, were recognizing that they couldn't keep the law. They kept wanting to keep the law, but they couldn't. Therefore, who is this beautiful gospel for? It's for those back in that situation. Oh, it's for those like us. For those like us who really do try to be good men and women, boys and girls. I've known very few people in my life that didn't make an effort to be a good person. <laughs> there have been a few. I don't think my fourth grade teacher was, was a good person. <laughs> Almost everybody that you know is trying, aren't they? People are not out there generally trying to cause harm. But the Bible says that all of our efforts to be good and righteous, it's not enough. Because the book of James says if you break the law, even one of the commandments, you're guilty of all of them. And this is what our situation is. And that's why this beautiful, glorious gospel is for us. Those of us who were like Paul, who had quite a history, didn't he? Because he wasn't always Paul, the apostle. He wasn't always Paul, the church planter. Who was he? He was Saul. He was the Pharisee. He was the arrogant one. He was very well trained in the rabbinic tradition. He knew the Torah. He knew all the rules and he kept them. And he was, by the way, very proud of himself. Well, some of us used to be very proud Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or Catholics. And we were very proud because we, we understood what we were supposed to do and we pretty much did it. But then Jesus' words to us when he said things like, oh, there's, there's the law of the spirit of the law that is of the heart. It's not just keeping the outward rule. It's about motive. It's about kindness. It's about gentleness. It's about generosity. It's about more than keeping the rules. It's about having the heart of love toward our brother. It's about loving the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and loving Him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it's about loving your neighbor as yourself. And it's about always doing that. And we've always then, based on that criteria, fallen short of the glory of God. We haven't borne very well the image of God. He made us, placed us here to be uh, an example of, he said, let us make man in our image and I'll put them on the earth and they can rule and reign upon the earth to bring glory to me and to show all of the universe how great I am in my creative handiwork. But we haven't done very well in displaying and living out that glory. And therefore, we need Romans, no condemnation, beautiful gospel. So, not only for whom, but what is this? It's, no condemnation. And now condemnation comes from us to us, I see, in three different ways. And the most important way is a judicial, uh, a, a, a judicial um, judgment from God. You're condemned because you're guilty. You've broken the commandments. And uh, God is a just, righteous God. He doesn't just wink when we break the rules and the laws and hurt other people and lie or steal. He doesn't wink at it. He judges it. He must to be consistent. You say, well, you think of God in human terms. You think of him like your kindly grandfather or grandmother. You think of God like that. We should see God much bigger than that. And God is perfectly just. He's not like a judge who lets some things go and he judges some things. And depending on who you are, whether he, whether he deals with it or not. What is this? No condemnation. I see of it, this condemnation three ways. Judicially, we're condemned because we are guilty. Why is the convict uh, sentenced to prison, probation? Why is the convict sentenced? Because he or she is guilty. This is condemnation, judicially. 
Uh, and this is, the, this is the most important thing as we think about Jesus, who was our judicial substitute. He died in our place. We were guilty, but our sins were placed on Jesus. His righteousness was placed on us. Nothing that we did. This was God's doing. And then I want to talk about for a second as it relates to condemnation. I want to talk about social and peer condemnation. I'm talking about a world in which presently, maybe more than ever before, we are constantly condemned by somebody. You're not thin enough. You're not tall enough. You're not young enough. You're not pretty enough. Your hair's not blonde enough. Your hair's not dark enough. Your eyes are too small. Your eyes are too big. You're not fast enough on the field. You're not, art, you're not articulate enough in the pulpit. You're not quick enough on the football. You see, you're constantly being condemned by persons in your peer group or in society. Somebody's always saying you're not enough. Jesus says, you're so much enough because I'm perfectly enough and you're unified with me. Um, haters on the left of me. Haters on the right of me. Haters here saying be it this way. Haters over here saying do it that way. Haters saying believe this thing. Haters saying believe that thing. Haters saying you can't say this. Haters saying oh no you must say the other thing. How many of you are sick and tired of living in a world where somebody else finds your thoughts a crime. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm sick and tired of that. My thoughts are not a crime. I have a right to be me. Authentically me, I've got a right. And so do you. And so therefore, we should not judge one another. Be careful now. Because we want these rights for ourselves. We just don't want to give them to other people who disagree with us. Haters on the left of me. Condemned are you. You don't think like I do. Haters on the right of me. You remember that song, Jokers to the left of me. Uh, creepers on the right, and I'm stuck in the middle with you. Remember the song. <laughs> How about we do it this way? Haters on the left of me. Haters on the right of me. And I'm stuck in the middle with me. <laughs> that brings me to the third point of condemnation. Not only condemnation, Judiciously, because we've broken God's law and condemnation, condemnation uh, socially. What about condemnation personally? How many hours of your life have you spent miserable because of your own thoughts about your own self? Haters on the left of me, haters on the right of me, and I'm stuck in the middle with me. And being stuck in the middle with me is worse than the, the haters here and there. Stuck in the middle with me. Because in my own brain, I'm running a tape. I'm what my daddy said I was. I'll never be this or that, just like he said I would never be. I'm stuck in the middle with me condemning myself when the Bible says there is no condemnation. No condemnation from anyone who has an opposing opinion. There's no condemnation. From God himself, who rightly could judge us for our sins, but he put our sins on Jesus. No condemnation judicially. No condemnation socially. And we must not have any condemnation personally. We must break the tape, spoiling the joys of life. Break it. Stop telling yourself how bad you are and start claiming your inheritance in Jesus Christ, who said there's no condemnation. You're free. Break the tape. Stop running it in your brain, making yourself miserable. You know who your biggest hater is? It's the one stuck in the middle with you, and it's you. Why don't you fire you and get you another you called Jesus living in you? And you believe what Jesus living in you says instead of what the old you keeps saying to yourself. And why not? Then when? When is this great thing to occur? Therefore, for all of those who need it, and what? No condemnation. And when? Right now. When is this great privilege of ours? Right now. It's heaven. For heaven only. 
Heaven is for the abundant life here and now also. Abundancy comes through right thinking. <coughs> I'm sorry. Romans 12, 1 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be pressed into the mold of the world. That's what makes you miserable. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that comes through the clarity of the revelation of Almighty God, your creator, about who you really are. All right. For whom and what and when right now available. Next, number four. In whom? In Christ Jesus. Where do we get this? Through the mechanism, the remedy, uh, the prescription that God has provided. How does a person break through from this, from this sense of, uh, of, uh, of wrong thinking? How, does this, how do we break through from our attraction to the old life and how do we break? Christ Jesus is God's prescription. If you get sick, the doctor gives you medication and you're supposed to take it. Um, it's kind of a joke in my house that I'm the opposite of a hypochondriac. And uh, so I told the elders the other night that I've been having some problems, health problems. And uh, you know some of them. And uh, I told the elders, I said, I'm the opposite of a hypochondriac. Hypochondriacs think they have every illness. And I'm the person who thinks I never am sick with anything. And so I asked the elders, I said, what is it? Is there a clinical name for this where you just refuse to think you're sick against all the evidence? Like my arm is broken. There's no, like your arm is broken. It's, ah, it's not broken. It's fine. Well, it's all against all evidence. There's got to be some clinical name for this. And so I said, man, what is the clinical name for the opposite of a hypochondriac? Against all evidence, I don't think I'm sick. And Peter Reese, our dear elder lead, where are you, Pete? With a small hand, Pete said, I said, what is the name, people opposite of hypochondriac? Against all evidence, you don't think you're sick. Pete said, well, then we called it stupid. <laughs> A small breath of, of clarity in a world of confusing uh, cacophony. Thank you, Peter. In whom do we have this beautiful reality of no condemnation? In Jesus himself. He is God's prescription. I'd be smart to do what the doctor tells me. And do you know why? Because they're smarter than I am. I should do what they tell me. You should do what God tells you. and Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation as that? What is your alternative route? If you will not go the route of Christ, God's chosen emissary and connection to us, if you will not go the route of the cross, what shall be your pathway so that you are not condemned. Is your path plan to walk righteously every day of your life with never a sin and perfectly abiding, bearing the image perfectly of your creator God? Is that your path you're planning? Good luck with that. For me, my path is the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. I count on no other one, not me, not any other man, just Jesus. And that's what we need. In whom it's Jesus. Then number five, and how? Now we get to verse two. For the law of the spirit of life set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. And how could this beautiful no condemnation life and truth, how could this beautiful thing be? How could it be? How? Because God did it by the spirit of life. The spirit of life is set in contrast, notice, to the law of sin and death. Let's take just a minute there. Law of the spirit of life. Law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death? The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. The law of sin and death. The wages of sin is death. This is a principle. This is how God has made the world. So that A plus B equals C without exception. This is God's way. The law of sin and death. The soul that sins shall surely die. What is the law of the spirit of life? This is the law that God has through Jesus Christ forgiven us of our sins and does not hold us guilty because he held Jesus guilty. In America and in, in civilized nations, we have this, the double jeopardy principle. Double jeopardy principle that having been tried and found innocent, you won't be tried again. We were found innocent because Jesus was found guilty, suffered and died for us. There's no double jeopardy in the gospel. We're set free from the law of sin and death. It's the principle of it, the law of it. It's broken. And in place of it, the law of the spirit of life. Now, since April 28th, 1990, I have been experiencing in various degrees of success the law of the principle of the spirit of life. Before that, I was on course, certainly, with the law of sin and death. I was born again, April 28, 1990, and from there until today, not always perfectly, many times faltering, often stumbling, but I've been experiencing the law of life by the Spirit of God. This is what you need. This is what you need. You don't need another religion. You don't need a series of duties. You don't need a job description at the church. You don't need anything in this world. What you need is what God provides through Jesus Christ and offers to you by the Spirit. And so the Spirit is what wakes you up and lets you know you need it. That's how the Spirit begins to work in you. The Spirit wakes you up and lets you know that you need the gospel. How do I know I need to be woken up? Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> how many of you in these days have ever spent time uh, streaming uh, a series of, of, of shows on Netflix or what, one after another? What do you call that? Binging. Binge watching one show after another. I'm not going to ask you the names of them. I know Dina does. Dina will come to bed about 2 a.m. I'm like, my goodness, I'm getting ready to wake up. She says, well, I watched 17 shows. Of <laughs> and I thought, well, th this is not something I would do, but I got trapped in it myself. And I won't tell you what the show was, but it had Kevin Costner in it. <clears throat> so I started watching it. Was that his name? You, you know the one. Was it Kevin Costner in it? Don't say the name of it. I can't, re I can't recommend it. So I'm, let me tell you what I went through. Now remember, I'm from a different generation. I grew up where there was no cell phones. We had a phone where you had to roll the thing around like that. I knew nothing about any of this. So I sit there. And I start watching the first show, and then the television says, do you want to watch the second show? I said, well, sure. And I watched the second one, and then the third one, and the fourth one, and it just keeps on going. And they keep asking me, you want another one? And I thought, is this what it feels like to be addicted to crack or drugs or something? You keep on saying, yes, I want to do the next one. It must be that like that. Now, in all honesty, how many of you have ever had this binging experience where, against logic, you know better. You got to work tomorrow. You got to get up. 
against every logic. You just keep hitting the button. Give me another one. I, I saw three hands. In my, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> let me get serious. Do you know that weird feeling you get between show one and show two or show four? It gets worse as you go deeper in it, I found. Like show 10 and 11, that's terrible. That weird feeling you get where you're like in a zone. It's like you don't even hardly know where you are. That weird feeling. You know what that feeling is like? That's like the life of every person who's ever lived and gone about their daily existence absent God. Every minute of everyone's life from the day they're born until the day, day they die or get born again, is in that weird space where they don't know what they're doing except they want to push the button and do the next one. And it's harmless and fun for me and for you to binge watch a show. But this is the reality of everyone without Jesus. Because you weren't created for that. You were created for intimacy with your Creator and fellowship with Him. You weren't created to live in malaise or deluge. You weren't created for confusion. You were created for knowledge and wisdom and abundance. You were created to have fellowship with your Creator, God. And this is why it's so strange to you to hear someone preach the gospel. It's so strange to you. It's as strange to you as it would be for you to tell me, you know you shouldn't watch another one because it's getting late. I can't help but want to watch another one. So preaching the gospel is this call, and I'm making it humanly to you, saying you are condemned already because you have not believed the gospel, but you're invited, yea, commanded to believe the gospel and be born again. You're commanded by your Creator to be born again. You're not coming to your senses because your senses are so abused and neglected by this present world. You can't come to your senses. Oh, but the Holy Spirit is how. How does this condemnation, none of it, be applied to you? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says to you, you need Jesus. And most of us in this room have heard that call and believed it and responded to it, acted upon it. Most of us have. Some of you have. How would you know you ought to? You would know you ought to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because you want to. I don't mean you want to because your grandma wants you to. I don't mean that you want to believe in Jesus because you think, oh, I, I should do it to be a good citizen, a good, good person in the name. I'm talking about deep inside of you, you know that God made a way through his son, the Lord Jesus, to absorb upon the cross in his body all of your sins, past, present, and future, so that you could live not condemned. And you want this. How do I know I should be a believer? And the Holy Spirit is calling, calling, calling. I know it because I want it. How do I know I'm hungry? Because I want it. I want food. How do you know you want Jesus? How do you know the Spirit? It's calling because you want Jesus. You'll never want Jesus. You'll just stay in that zone like me between episodes. That'll be how you live in your life. And it'll be that way until the judgment. And then at the judgment, ultimately, you will stand face to face and you will know that you were called and called, but you were, you, you were dull of hearing and refused to repent and believe. And oh, how terrible the judgment. How many of you want Jesus today? Me too. One of the men, the man that we buried Friday night, I'd say, how many of you want Jesus? He was always the guy who said, I want Jesus. I do. Well, hey, I, hey, man, you've been with Jesus 75 years. Great. I'm talking about some new of you. April 28th, when I knew I wanted Jesus, somebody told me I ought not to be private about it because Jesus wasn't private when he died for me. He stood up and said, I'll stand up for them. What are we supposed to do? Slink around like our religion's a big secret? How about I finish the sermon this way? 
Is there anyone who doesn't want to be condemned and they know they're on that journey right now, but they do believe in Jesus? And they'll stand up publicly and say, I believe in Jesus. Anybody like that? Who will be first? I believe in Jesus. There's one. Shane, stand up. Have you ever told anybody you believed in Jesus? Welcome to the family. Anyone else? I'm talking to believers. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your support. I'm talking about in the room, you have never stood up in front of any audience boldly and said, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus. Stand up. What's your name? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? How do you know you ought to do it? Because you want to do it. You want to stand up and make a confession. What's your name, dear? Virginia, Virginia who? Virginia, um, what is your faith history up to this point? Have you been a, have you been a Christian your whole? What? We're, we're glad you're here. Thank you. All right. Now, some of you, some of you felt like I did back in the day during those days when I was so nervous, like I'm nervous. What, 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 what are they going to do? Are they going to embarrass me? I called their names. I'm sorry. I did that. If it, if it made you feel reluctant, Jesus is going to call your name. Don't be reluctant to be a bold witness for Jesus. But you feel like you need some more. Something's bothering you. You want to think something about it. Ask your youth people, ask me, ask one of the elders, ask your family to talk to you more about it, okay? Is everybody good with that? All right, let's pray. And while I pray, the song people are going to come up. Now, Father, you are so wonderful that you have made a way for us not to be condemned. You are gracious to us and so kind and this is for remedy of sin and heaven and hope but you're also powerful and caring and loving for our present life too and you help us in the challenges that we face we thank you thank you for the people who are here to listen and worship and thank you for um, for those people that maybe new and first time stood up to, uh, to testify that they are believers in Jesus. I pray you would comfort and teach and instruct each of those people. In Jesus' name, amen.